Welcome to Showing Up Solo, your go-to source for solopreneur success in the digital world. You're not just running a business, you're wearing all the hats, from CEO to content creator. What if I told you there's a way to master online marketing without sacrificing all your time? Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Showing Up Solo. Today, I'm gonna be talking content strategy, quality versus quantity with the incredible Chelsea Evans Flower, CEO of Scott Social. Chelsea, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I have listened to so many episodes and I'm excited to finally be on one myself. So thanks for having me. Oh, you're gonna make me blush now. I love it when I have a fat. <laughs> <laughs> so Chelsea, I would love it if you could introduce yourself to my listeners, let them know a little bit more about yourself, what you do, and why you're such an expert in this field. Yeah. So um, like you said, I'm the CEO of Scott Social. I started Scott Social around five years ago. We're a boutique social media agency, and we work with small to medium-sized businesses on elevating their social media presence. Um, We work with a lot of women-owned businesses. We're a full female team. So lots of feminine energy, just the way we like it. Um, And yeah, we also do paid ads, email marketing, photo shoots, really anything within that creative marketing realm. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I love love supporting um, fellow women entrepreneurs. I actually... um, when when um you reached out to be a guest um i think it was uh, you or your assistant um included an episode and i listened to the first five minutes of that episode and i was like yep i gotta get this gal on the show um because your story resonated with me so much i think you were talking about um wanting to be like wanting to start your own marketing business and having a few mentors kind of laugh at you I guess or it was like yes. um, could you tell me a little bit more about that because I think it, it really resonated with me and I think it resonates with a lot of my listeners yeah I've I've been entrepreneurial since I was very young even to the point of I would see girls having a lemonade stand and I'd set up a smoothie stand down the street because I knew <laughs> that's what that's what the market needed right I've I've just always been really entrepreneurial. And so I always knew that I would start a business and my parents did too. They were very supportive. My teachers were supportive. I just had a lot of yeses and encouragement throughout my life. And then I went to college and I started getting paired with mentors. And the first mentor I spoke with, I was asking her questions about how she got into marketing and what she thinks of me starting an agency. I was 19 years old at the time of asking this question and she did laugh. She, she laughed to my face and said, yeah, you're going to need, you know, 10, 15 years of experience first. So put that on the back burner and start here. So that was the first time I was told no. And my first job, my boss would always say, Hey, you know, we're, we're a really great team. I'm great at doing the business stuff and you're great at doing marketing. And how I interpreted that, whether correctly or not, was that you're capable of doing marketing, but not capable of running the business side of things. And I really believed that. That was the second no that I received. And those two felt really heavy. They, they were really yeah. huge weights on my shoulders of me for the first time really doubting, am, am I supposed to be a business owner? Am I actually capable of doing this? And yet it was still just nagging, this nagging feeling 24-7 of just feeling like working for someone else isn't what I'm meant to be doing. And in the meantime, I just had freelance clients popping out of the woodwork wanting to work with me. It really happened serendipitously. But at that moment, I thought, you know what? If they're right, that's okay, but I'm going to test it. I really need to do this. It's not, it's not even that I want to, but like, I need to do this for myself. And within the first three months of starting my company, I was able to replace my full revenue from my, from my full-time job. And that's when I started to realize that they were wrong and I was absolutely capable of doing this. Yeah. So I'm, I love that story. Um, I love your story and it's interesting. Um, because you and I have both ended up in similar fields, but from very different angles. Um, I think I'm safe in guessing that you're 
couple, a couple years younger than me, <laughs> um, <laughs> more than a couple. Um, so I, when I was in high school, like social media wasn't a job. Like Facebook came out when I was in university. Um, like I remember when you still had to have a college email address to join. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, like <laughs> I'm, awesome. yeah, that's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, there wasn't an Instagram, you know, and, and so, um, like, I remember my, my careers teacher talking about how when we, when we're older, we might actually have a career that doesn't currently exist and thinking, yeah, right. Like I'll be like, you know, space bus driver or something like, and I didn't even think about the, the fact, but the job that you and I both have in terms of social media marketing, it did not exist mm-hmm. when I was in high school. It was not a career path. It was the more traditional forms of marketing. And I think there's a lot of, and so I went into like my twenties and um, thinking like, I really wanted to start a business for myself for a while. I thought about being like a personal shopper, personal stylist. Um, But I was just like, I don't know how to get clients. And I I obviously don't know enough about business because I don't have a business degree or a marketing degree. And thinking that um, there was this like magic formula that you needed to have in order to be able to do it. And then after way too much time spent working in jobs, I was overqualified for, like over, over capable, like there was, they were way beneath my capability level. Um, and I finally lost my job in the pandemic. And then it was kind of a shit or get off the pot moment. Um, mm-hmm. I was like, I could go find another boring admin job or I could, uh, you know, try running a business myself. Yeah. And so I did. <laughs> and Amazing. I kind of, I, I learned everything like on the go. Um, and I just, like, like, within like three or four months, I had enough clients that I was like sustaining us. Like I was able to cover, I mean, we're a family of four. So I've got two kids and my husband. So we were like, I needed to earn enough to like cover rent and groceries and stuff. Um, and I was doing that. I was managing to support us. Um, and like it, that's, it's just that's amazing that you went into it with this kind of like you kind of like eased into well, not eased into but you kind of it kind of came for you it sounds like like yes the did. demand was there and so by the time you went it was more like yeah why am I not doing this you know yeah it was it ended up being an easier transition than I thought because it was gradual I mean I filed for my business license in 2018 but don't you know, Scott Social started in 2019. I had about a year ramp up period of just very little work, starting to work on processes. So it was a ramp up period. Whereas yours was, hey, welcome. It's Here's like a, one. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> it's pandemic. Now you have to find clients. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was very much like I didn't go in intending to do marketing. I went in as a virtual assistant doing more of what I knew, but you have to know how to market yourself mm-hmm. to get clients. And especially as an online business, this was 2020 when I got laid off in 2020. So I started my job like June, 2020. Wow. So like I had to figure out how to find clients and I couldn't do the traditional, like going with business cards around the place and stuff, you know, you have to like figure out how to do it online. And so I did a lot of learning very, very quickly for how to yes. use online marketing. Um, I, I'm interested to know how you approached marketing yourself then and gaining new clients as someone who's come from a marketing background like was there a difference in the approach you took from what you were doing as part of a larger bit like a larger firm or agency to what you started doing as your boutique agency yeah so it would make sense that being in social media that we would have started on social media first and started a newsletter but that's really actually not what happened um all of our clients in the beginning came from referral And so when I knew I I wanted to go freelance and then start an agency, I told everybody, absolutely everybody, because I knew that they were going to be the ones to get this business off the ground. I started going to networking events. I, I was getting my, I mean, I was out there pretty much nonstop, at least talking to someone. And it's easy to talk about it when you're first starting too, because you're excited. What I realized a few years later is that it's not scalable to only grow through referral. 
if you're growing an agency, if you're staying as a freelancer, it could be sustainable to keep your business afloat and healthy and growing. Yeah, but as if an you agency, can find one of those, like if you yeah. can find those like long-term relationship clients where you know, like, okay, I filled my roster and I don't need anyone else and it's just me. Yeah. But then again, like you also need a safety net. Like what if one of these amazing clients suddenly sells their business or pivots or something and they disappear and you don't have anything in place to capture new people. Like you don't have anyone in the waiting room ready to fill their spot. Yes. Yes, exactly. So when I talk to newer freelancers and people who are just starting, I always tell them, I don't care if you can fill your entire pipeline with referral clients. And if that's enough for now, if your long-term goal is growing and building an agency, you have to start now. Even if it's just a little bit, start posting here and there, get your presence out there, start building an email list because you'll thank yourself later down the line. We launched our own organic marketing presence about three years after the start of Scott Social and yeah, then you're you're kind of starting at zero. I mean, it, it takes a long time to build up a presence on those platforms, just like it does with our clients. So that I would say if there's one mistake that I could call a mistake more than even just a learning lesson, but oh man, I really should have done that. It was to start marketing sooner. Um, there's also freelance platforms like Fiverr and Upwork. And yes, it does work to land clients in the beginning, but eventually you're going to come into a quality problem with those platforms too, where the clients you can find on Upwork aren't typically as high quality. They're not looking for as long of partnerships. They're not going to pay as much. They may even treat you more like an employee instead of a contractor, which has issues of its own. And so while you can rely on those a little bit in the beginning, my advice to someone who's starting their own brand is to to be on social and email and just get it out there, start building it so that they can lean on it later when they need it. Yeah, I actually, that was one of the pieces of advice I was given when I first started out as a VA is to avoid those kinds of sites because, mm-hmm. I mean, first of all, you don't make all your money. They they get they get paid through connecting you with people. Yes. Um, and it's difficult to set like your a proper fair hourly rate. And um and also, yeah, like what I found is like the quality of clients that you get, it's better to um like I've gone to the point where my messaging is clear enough that if I get on a call like a, a discovery call, I I don't even really have discovery calls anymore. I get on a call with someone, I'm like, okay are you ready for this service? Um, Yes or no kind of thing. It's it's because if you get that messaging right and you get your marketing messaging on point, um, you're going to be attracting the right kinds of clients, the ones who want to keep coming back to you, who want to keep working with you. Um, And that's that's the power of, of going in strategically with your marketing, wouldn't you say? Yes, absolutely. I could not agree more. Yeah. So the topic at hand today is obviously content strategy, quality versus quantity. Mm -hmm. Um, I know just firsthand and and from many, 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 many conversations with clients, content creation can be overwhelming. It can, um, it often falls to the bottom of the to-do list. Um, It's, it's just seems to be really, really intimidating to a lot of, especially solopreneurs because Um, If marketing is not your jam, like we're a little bit of a special case because we do marketing. So we're just doing more of what we we do. Right. But if uh, I've had clients who are therapists, for example, so that's what they do. They're not marketers, but they have to become marketers if they're going to market themselves as a solo practitioner. You know, and so how do they how what would advice do you give someone who's in that position on like how to come up with a content strategy and how to manage that extra workload in addition to doing, you know, what you do. Absolutely. My advice always is quality over quantity for many reasons. Of course, the reasons that you just talked about, which is that solopreneurs or even business owners that have a team do not have unlimited hours in the day and our attention is being divided in a million directions. And so when it comes to your marketing, you don't have unlimited hours as much as we would love that. You don't have unlimited hours to create a ton of content and just be a content machine. So you have to prioritize. 
And even if you look at delegating to your team, if you have maybe freelancers or an in-house team, they also don't have unlimited hours. And so you need to be leading them to pursue quality over quantity. And you might be wondering like, okay, what does that actually mean when applied to content? That means choosing your channels selectively. So instead of being on all meta channels, TikTok, Pinterest, and just throwing spaghetti at a wall, which which one single platform is your priority? What is your priority? Stick with that. And if you feel comfortable branching out to a second, maybe a third, that is okay. But what is that one platform? Start there in terms of how many times you're posting per week. Yes, it would be ideal to post three or four times per week. So you always have a piece of content that's circulating and it'd be great to post a story every day. But how realistic is that really if you're a solopreneur? What if instead you posted one or two posts per week that were really, really powerful? Hey there, fellow dreamers and future solopreneurs. Are you at the very beginning of your journey, eager to kickstart your business and find those first clients? I've got something special just for you. My free guide, Find Your First Clients, three actionable steps to jumpstart your business. Inside, I've distilled the wisdom of successful solopreneurs into three actionable steps tailored for newcomers like you. Expect straightforward, no-nonsense advice that you can put into action today. Ready to turn your business dreams into reality? Grab your free copy now at showingupsolo.com forward slash free. Unlock the secrets to landing your very first clients and start your entrepreneurial journey on the right foot. I'm here to guide you every step of the way. Um, There's an Instagram account. I think it's called People of New York, right? Or Stories of New York. He, um, oh gosh, I'm going to have to tell you so you can put it in your show notes, but he interviews New Yorkers. And post like a six or seven part series, but he'll only post like one a month or something. And people wait for the moment that he is posting because they are so valuable and so interesting that as soon as that first post goes live in that seven part series, you've been waiting 30 days for this. Everyone's like, hey, wait a minute. He's posting. Oh, I think it's called Humans of New York. Humans of, yes, that sounds, yeah. It's it's interesting you say that because so I have a, the, the podcast, it comes out every two weeks. And um, I sent an email newsletter that same day and a LinkedIn newsletter. I sent one out today. Um, this is, of course, we're recording this ahead of time, mentioning that next week's my birthday. And no kidding, within five minutes, I got a text from someone saying, happy birthday. <laughs> um, because like, and it just goes to that they open my email. And it's because I've you've got that habit, right? I'm not sending them an email every day or even every week, it's every two weeks, but they know it's going to come on Wednesday morning every other week. And so you build that habit. I think that's what you're getting at, right? Is like build that anticipation and that expectation in your audience. Yes. Yes, exactly. Because at the end of the day on social media, you're competing against people's friends and family, the people that they love the most in this planet. That is who you're competing against. And even though that can sound a little overwhelming, it will help to inform your content strategy and really sink in the sentiment of quality over quantity. Your posts have to be that valuable that they would read your post after their best friend and before their mother, right? That's really where your content needs to land. And I think where people get caught up is that there's a lot of misinformation online. And if we think about what kinds of posts go viral, they it's always the really absurd ones, right? The really just do this and get this and you'll make millions. Like that's going to go viral because it's absurd, but it's rarely true. Um, and I think that Gary V was really the initiator of this just building a content machine, post as much as you can. That's how you, that's how you get successful. Um, he has a quote. I think it's the worst quote I've ever heard. It says, if you are not producing a hundred pieces of content every single day, you are leaving the greatest opportunity in the world on the table. That is a direct quote 
I I just saw your reaction. You just like sunk into the couch. I, I was just like, no, 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 no. Um, I am the opposite. First of all, I am wearing my my just go batshit crazy shirt today. I'm a believer in doing a big amount of work like once and then chopping it up yep. into smaller pieces of content so that maybe you do have a ton of content coming out regularly, but you're mm-hmm. only putting the energy in at the beginning. But um mm-hmm. That, that whole thing is like, this is something I, you have to remember. It's something I have to remember too, is I'm not a content creator. And most of my clients, they're not content creators. That's a different thing, right? Like some of my favorite YouTube channels, uh, Mariah Elizabeth, uh, Viva La Dirt League, they're my latest obsession, they're, but they're content creators. That is their job. Their job is to create content online. So yes, they should be creating tons of content though they don't, Mariah Elizabeth posts like once a week, you know, it's going to be Friday at 1 PM Eastern. And she doesn't really do shorts that much. She hardly, I think she doesn't use Instagram very much. Like, yeah. um, so, and she's, she's got millions of subscribers, you know, Viva La Dirt League, they have a schedule. It's like one video a day and you know, it's coming out. Um, but like their job is content creation. So even the content creators aren't producing like a hundred pieces of content a day. No. And, and you're a they business used owner, to. Yeah. You know, like and, if you're and, a business owner, mm-hmm. like your job isn't like, you're not a content creator. You produce, I mean, you do create, you produce content for clients, but you're creating content to help them promote their businesses. You're not selling your content. If that makes, I don't know if I'm getting too, do you know what I mean? Like it's yes. like my podcast is a tool, is a means to an end. The content I'm creating, it, the purpose is to help inform my clients and attract new ones, not to get YouTube subscribers. Yes. You know? That's yeah. yeah, exactly. And yeah, if we look back to when Instagram was, well, gosh, even before that, if we look at when YouTube was popular in what, 2008, or I don't know when, when YouTube was first popular, but it's been a long time. And yes, the more you posted, the more views you would get. When Facebook first came out, the more you posted, the more views. You could post something on Instagram and get 20 followers just for posting a really grainy, pixelated photo that has like terrible lighting. You would still get followers. I mean, that yeah. that used to be a thing. And so Gary V, you know, I, I think that he is correct, at least recommending for that time. But times have changed and it's it's fossil advice now. I mean, it's really, yeah, it's just, it's not going to work anymore. And so the more that you can focus on quality, 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 the better it's going to perform and the more sanity you're going to have in your life. Yeah. So mm-hmm. obviously this is going to be a really difficult question to answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll just preface that because obviously every platform is different. You know, like the LinkedIn algorithm is different to the Instagram algorithm. Um, The types of content you need, like Mm -hmm. videos versus written and everything. But let's just imagine that I'm a brand spanking new solopreneur. Um, Mm -hmm. Marketing is not my, my jam and I've just, but I've just started my business and I know I need to be building an online presence to find clients, to make sure I've got a consistent pipeline. What is the strategy you would recommend for me in those early days? Yeah. Ooh, that my first, what, what should be my kind of uh, like overarching strategy for the first year, maybe like as I get, you know, sink my teeth into it. Mm. My first recommendation would be to think critically about, again, do you actually need social media? Do you actually need email? Do you need blog? Like what is the main place that you're going to be getting clients now and within the next, you know, one to three years. And if you can sit there and say, yes, social is where I'm going to be finding clients or nurturing them, then okay, we can say it's it's time to jump on social. Next, I would pick one or two platforms to focus on. So if if you're an e-commerce business, let's say Instagram, for example, if you're targeting a younger audience, let's go with TikTok, really think critically about where are your people, what platform are they on, and focus on that platform. You can always cross post to the others, but it's unrealistic to say that in the beginning, you'll be able to dedicate a, a, a personalized strategy to Instagram and a personalized strategy to Pinterest and LinkedIn. So just choose one. And then from there, 
I, if you have the time to posting two to three times per week is a really great cadence because there's always a piece of content that's circulating. But again, if you can't consistently keep to that schedule with really great contents that are not filler, valuable content, um, yeah, then you'll want to make me back. grown more or roll my eyes more than seeing a business post like a picture and then like one sentence. Mm hmm. I write like I bet that would be like a no no on your list too. It's like because it just feels like oh, well, but so well, it depends on what the picture. It depends I mean, on if the it's picture like a stock and the photo, and if it's just like, but but when it feels like they just posted content for oh. the sake, it's one thing if it's like a super powerful picture and the statement is like leading on to something and it's a teaser and it's going to get some like like yeah. that's one thing that's like it's really strategically done. But I see a lot of people just post you know, a picture of their desk and it's Wednesday, that's filler content. Oh no, that is filler content. And that it, it just isn't going to do anything at all. Every single piece of content that you publish should have a purpose. You should be able to sit there and say, this post is going to inform people about this process or about this, or it's going to make them laugh. And in doing so, we're going to build a relationship. Like you should be able to say exactly how they're going to perceive this post and what you want to have happen with that post. There there should be a, a real reason for it. And if you cannot think of it, don't post it. Yeah, it's, it's not going to land well. It's going to lower your engagement rate and people will probably scroll on to the next post. I mean, it's it's sad. It feels kind of doggy, doggy world sometimes, but that's the truth. Like I said, um, you're competing with friends and family. And if we think about the algorithm, and I know algorithm is a very scary word for people because it seems like this mystical equation in the background that no one understands. And while that's kind of the case, we do know that it's, it's being continually updated with user habits. So all the algorithm is, is user interest and user habits. So every time you go on Instagram, you are changing the Instagram algorithm based on your habits, right? And so as we know that videos are doing better, people are more interested in them. It's not that someone behind the scenes at Instagram said, hey, let's turn on the switch. Let's make small business owners create videos now. It's based on the end user. End users yeah. now are interested in video. And so that's where the algorithm is swaying. So consider your end user at all times, not the algorithm. Think about your user and indirectly you will be thinking about the algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's, it's an interesting balance between, um, and I know we could talk about this like all day long, um, but um, <laughs> like it's an interesting balance between like imperfect action and not letting fear of doing it wrong stop you. But also if you're going to do something do it right, I guess, or do it impactfully. Like if it's gonna, if it's worth doing, like make sure it's worth doing versus yes. doing yes. it for the sake of doing it. And you know, like it doesn't have to be perfect, but don't just do something for the sake of doing something. Exactly. I think impactful, that yeah. word that you just said is spot on. I'd say look for value, look for impact, look for alignment. And that is your post. Imperfectly impact. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and really sticking with that during a launch strategy is going to do wonders for your brand as opposed to sticking to this really regimented schedule of, okay, I need to do this every day and check this box and check this box, just focusing on the impact. Like you said, that is the strategy. That's, yeah. that's what will be successful. Well, wonderful having you here, Chelsea, because you've really shared some great insights, especially the one about the competing with friends and family. I've had a couple people come on and talk about social media and no one's ever actually used that one. And it's very insightful. I really like that takeaway. It's it's definitely going to make me think about how even I write my content now, like in that kind of who I'm competing with. My one is always, I want to be, I want to be what they read when they're on the toilet. You know, <laughs> isn't that what you do? You go to the, you go to the loo and you, you plug the phone yeah. and you start scrolling, right? And so I'm always like, look, you want to be the person on, on, on their phone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love I that. Freedom, you know? Um, so before we wrap up, um, is there, do you have any key takeaways or like last minute bits of wisdom for my audience, for my listeners? If they, if they could take away one thing from this episode, what would it be? 
I would limit you to one. <laughs> oh, one takeaway. I would say my one takeaway would be to lean in to what you're really good at and and lean away from from what you're not, right? Or what you don't offer. So in social media, when we apply quality over quantity, lean into the areas that just absolutely light your heart on fire and you know align so well with your audience and leave the rest. Yeah. So if like if for example you're a really great writer, um like I've got a client who writes incredibly engaging newsletters, right? So that's the content she should be leaning into. Yeah. Like use finding ways to make that her social media strategy versus trying to come up with dance reels. <laughs> yep, <laughs> exactly. And if you're great with dance reels, do it. Exactly. Um, if that's where you shine, you know, then yeah, do more of what you enjoy doing and, and enjoy doing well. Yep, so. exactly. Great. So where can my listeners find you, get in touch, um, cyber stalk you? <laughs> yeah, they, um, everyone can follow us at Scott Social Marketing on Instagram. We also have a newsletter that goes live every other week and we share some really great social media tips, trends that we're seeing in the industry, um, any industry updates that are shocking, crazy new. So subscribe there and stay in the loop. Wonderful. We'll leave all the links in the show notes for everybody. So you can go take a look in there and give Chelsea and, and her business a follow. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope you found this as insightful as I did. You can tell I'm geeking out on the social media marketing convo. Um, and I hope you geeked out with us. Um, until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Showing Up Solo. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review or sharing your thoughts in the comments. These simple gestures help us appease the algorithm gods and continue to bring you great, free education. Ready to navigate the world of marketing with confidence? Take the Marketing Compass Quiz, available at showingupsolo.com, to discover the next phase of your journey. And don't forget to explore our range of courses and coaching programs while you're there. Let's transform your solo venture into a thriving success story, together. Until the next episode, keep showing up and making your mark in the world of solopreneurship. See you soon.